NZ Aero Sports, Icarus Canopies, now Gyro. That's right, we've rebranded, and Gyro is our next generation. It honours our founder, as that's the name we knew him by, but Gyro also marks the start of a new chapter. And not to be biased, but it's going to be fucking epic. Long story short, we're more us than ever. So if you're new to the sport, or even a Sky God Ninja Turtle, welcome. I think our valiant leader Lucy, Gyro's daughter, Says it best. And we still got that fuck your attitude. <laughs> Rebrand. Woo. Rebrand woo indeed, Lucy. Anyway, head over to gyro.com for more info and get amongst your legends. I was 19, broke, unemployed, and sold my girlfriend's canopy for drug money. So I thought I better sew her a new one. What a sentence and what a story. This describes the humble yet outrageous beginnings of NZ Aerosports, the home of Icarus Canopies, in the words of our founder himself. From getting a paratrooper toy from his mom, watching parachutes at the DZ as a six-year-old, jumping off the wharf with a parachute made from bedsheets, doing his first jump at 16, sewing his first canopy on a borrowed machine at 19, and starting to sell parachutes out of a garage in 1986, Paul Gyro Martin had an undying love for the sky. Our company started with one man with the wildest of spirits in a true blue sky dream, a renegade. In the time that Gyro created and ran the Icarus Canopies brand until he passed away in 2017, he pushed everything he had to its limits. We miss him and we always will. Gyro is the next generation of NZ Aerosports. It honors our founder, of course, because it was the name we all knew him by, but Gyro the rebrand also marks the start of a new chapter, our next jump. Gyro is the space between sound and silence, art and science, chaos and calm. Gyro is a state of epic tranquility that transcends understanding. That moment, in the door, in free fall, mid-swoop, where nothing but the present exists. A perfect balance of euphoria and thrill. Gyro captures our passion for flying and our commitment to designing break-the-fucking-rules canopies that deliver pilots pure, wild flight. Coming straight from the cockpit, it's another episode of Lunatic Fringe with the fucking pilot. Ready, set, go! Back in the can for another episode of the Lunatic Fringe Podcast. And the last time I saw this face, he was in a shitload of pain and had been working way too fucking hard. And I don't know how much of that's changed. So let's just get into it. Who the fuck are you and what do you do? I'm in Matt Yara. Uh, I'm a traveling TI, I'm an examiner. Uh, I travel around the world, jumping out of all kinds of planes and every plane I can and meet everybody I can. So yeah, you, that's pretty cool. You've been, uh, you've been doing this for a little while now. Yeah, 26 years, so a long time. We've been at it pretty much uh, about the same amount of time. I'm just coming up on 29, so we're right around the same. We're the same generation, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We actually met in, what, 2006 because of Nate Dexter. Yeah, yeah. We were working together at uh, at good old CSC. Yeah. Yeah, Fucking wonderful. (laughs) <laughs> Hinkley, man, back when it was in the corn. That was honestly out of uh, um, both the different drop zones. I know that Rochelle, where it is now, is is the uh, upgraded version. But I fucking loved Hinkley. Man, it, it was like we lived together. We were around each other seven days a week. Yep. It was the drama that most drop zones have. We just had a lot of fun. It was yeah, just man. fun. You know what I mean? We were busy. Yeah, we were. And I, I tell you, from the pilot's perspective, there was a, a very, uh, it was interesting going to work every day, pre flighting a twin otter literally in the middle of a cornfield. Right. Oh, yeah. It was super hot. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> so, as I always do with the podcast, I'm going to jump you all the way back to the beginning of your time, not necessarily in skydiving, but in anything that normal society considers extreme. Okay. Yeah, I'm from Springfield, Missouri, uh, originally, and I got into a little bit of rock climbing, some uh, wakeboarding, uh, 
skiing, stuff like that, basically on water. I was a water guy. Uh, and about 1998, or what, 98, uh, my mom bought me a gift certificate. Like, let's go do a skydive. And it was an IED, so jump out, pop, there goes your parachute. And the first thing I walked in the first jump course was like, I want to do this for a living. This is me. And uh, that took my career from there on out. So, now, what uh, uh, what prompted your mom to want to do that? Was it one of those bucket list things for her? Or? It was kind of one of those bucket lists. And what she ended up, she never jumped. She just gave it to me. It was like a $99 buy one, get one. Here you go. You're into this kind of stuff and do it. And yeah, that's how it ended up. And that's mom. Job, so <laughs> that's actually that's pretty damn cool for mom especially in 98 because i mean granted 98 skydiving had started to become pretty mainstream and tandems yep. were pretty normal by then but that's still pretty cool for a mom to suggest hey let me go throw you out of a plane right right, right. yeah actually at the drop zone i was from they didn't actually start doing tandems until the year after so really still, yeah so they picked it up at that point in time. it's so funny it's funny looking back on it, right? Because, I mean, I- I'm sure you're the same way. I know I've been in the sport for almost 29 years, but it doesn't feel like it. It feels like, you know, this is all recent history. Right. But we started just when tandems were really kicking off. Yeah, yeah. And that was, uh, you know, we were still jumping, what, Vector 2, Vector 1s, the dual hawk. <laughs> yep. Yeah, With man. the old, old, can- uh, old canopies, easies, and uh, higher, high lifters, stuff. 360s, 421s, 500, F111 tandem canopies, train wax every fucking time. Yeah, it was awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and hanging head low. I mean, that I think that's how I learned how to free fly was doing yeah. tandems because you're just hanging off your ass. Exactly. It was totally different. Back then. <laughs> so, you know, and I, I always think of myself as young in the sport, and I'm sure you do too. And then yeah. when people are talking, you're like, Oh, I've been to, you know, you start talking about World Free Ball Convention or Couch Freaks or all these other movies, and they're like, you're old school. And you're like, you know, when, when it, when I realized that I was a, uh, now uh, a previous generation was when I was out at the desert campus in Dubai and I was talking to Omar. And for you and I, Omar Al Hijalan, we fucking, he was the, the free flyer. You know, it was him and Olaf Zipser. And uh, he was talking to a group of people and some younger jumpers and and uh, said some really fun stuff and told a good story and then walked away. And one of the younger jumpers was like, so who is that anyway? And I'm like, fuck you. (laughs) Who is that? Fuck you. That's Omar. Omar who? Fuck you. And that's when you walk away going, oh, I'm I'm old. I'm still that way, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well... (laughs) We're also the generation that physically has just beat the crap out of ourselves, right? Oh, my God. Yeah, that's for sure. You know, I mean, can't think of anybody that's in our age that's been in a long as we have been in the sport that has had some kind of injury, surgery to the sport or something like that. Yeah. And it's just one of those things. But, I mean, we made the sport so much easier for the new generation. Sure. Yeah. Well, and I mean, that was kind of the point, right? Right. <laughs> so so you you go out to the drop zone you do this first instructor assisted and you decide that's what you want to do was there a plan before skydiving like was what what were you going to be uh so i was in construction framing houses and building pools so it was kind of like going down that road and kind of lost i was really kind of lost in this area it's a huge drug capital um and it's a great place to grow up but that's the problem you know, I, all my friends now are gone or down a bad line path or in prison. So thank God I ran into skydiving because I would afraid that I would actually be going down that path again. Sure. Well, I mean, it's it's funny because for as as hardcore as the partying can sometimes get in skydiving, and again, we're from a generation that went big in the air and on the ground. Skydiving yep. was something you sobered up for. Because you had to jump, you know, I mean, you had a long week ahead of you with all this shit to do. So you could only go so hard, you know, and if you're in small town, Missouri, and you're not jumping, <laughs> there's no off button. Right, there is no off button. So, yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, 
that was one of my loves. I mean, it kind of got me out of it a little bit more sure. being down the road with, you know, I would say the problem about Missouri is it's the map. You know what I mean? And that's sure. the bad thing. So well, and it's, it's got to be hard to to um, be transitioning to a into a life like skydiving and then watching your friends take this horrible path. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I go back home once a year, and it's for see my best friends to friends I saw in high school. And it's lost, it's just lost. They, yeah, yeah. Like, oh my God, what is wrong with you? You know. And yes. I was a proud guy, so they're like, "Oh, you're doing good." <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. I know it. I know it. Well, I was I. I... I didn't have too many rocks along the way when I was younger, but I was one of those guys that everybody's like, I have no fucking clue what that guy's going to be when he grows up. Right, I mean, right. We know he's going to be okay, but how we have no fucking clue, you know? So when I tell old friends or when I've told old friends that, you know, I've had this career in skydiving and flying, none of them are surprised. They're like, yeah, sure. Okay. That sounds as good as anything. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody goes, you can make a living on this. And I'm like, That's, that's my favorite fucking question. How do you make a living jumping out of airplanes? Well, <laughs> you don't really. You just kind of survive. <laughs> yeah. So um, you go through your training and, and you know you want to be a skydiver. How does uh, how do you transition into being a proper full-time skydiver? And then how did that work its way into working in the sport? So uh, I had a great drop zone owner at the time. His name was Brian Wilson. And he really promoted me to actually start working in the sport, not just jumping in the sport. So he actually would pick me up every day, take me to the drop zone, and he started off with me packing. So I packed for a few years. As soon as I got the uh, jump numbers, I took coach ready. And then the next step was into uh, tandems. And from there, uh, AFF with Brom, tandems with him, and then going into I the static line. But I had about 30 jumps on tandems and a Casa pulled up. And uh, Jim West out of uh, Zeny, Ohio pulled up. We do a boogie that weekend. And he, he basically goes, hey, I need a tandem instructor to hop in the plane and come back with me to Ohio. And I was like, and, and Brian, being the owner, is like, hey, take Matt. He needs to get out of here. I mean, he, he, I want him to get other experience, other places. And I jumped on that plane and rode with uh, Jim back to his home and stayed there for a few months and came back and it just kept on going. More people wanted me to come out. The owner of this drop zone is still around to this day, but he always promotes his instructor to go somewhere to get more education because he's like, I'm a very small drop zone. You're not going to learn as much as you need to learn from a big drop zone. So I want you to go travel. I want you to see people. I want you to get ideas and then come back. Sure. Well, I mean, that's that's an awesome way to do it, because at the end of the day, all you're doing is bringing back more talent to his pool. Right. And that's and even today, like he's sending his instructors to me to go work with them in Iceland to Egypt. And, you know, they come with me to events and stuff like that. So they get better. At it, so. Well, not to mention it, it uh, it kind of uh, short circuits the burnout process. Right. By far. By far. And that's the reason I kind of travel so I don't get involved with drama and burn it. Because every yeah. time I get a new place, it's brand new. It's wonderful. It's great. Seeing all these people and having so much fun with them and stuff like that. You know? Yeah, it's, it's nice when you're the the new guy, uh, even if you know people when you're the new guy at a new place and, and everything's kind of fresh. And it's when you've been up like me in Dubai for 10 years. By the time you hit year 10, that's just that fucking grumpy asshole. Yeah, he's a good pilot, but fuck that guy. <laughs> you know, And you get put back down to like where I'm at now, they always think I'm Yoda of tandems. I'm all like, what are you talking about? You know, right. like I'm a instructor. I like throwing drills. But I go to a new place and I'm just the new guy. Sure. And that, that's been awesome. So I get back down to here and I get to go, you know, behind everybody and I get to see everything. It makes it so much Absolutely. Well, and I think it also kind of um it gets rid of the uh, um the uh I'm a fraud mentality because if you get going for too long and people just naturally assume you're the guy then you start walking around and either you think I am the guy, which is a horrible way to think, or you start thinking, am, 
D- nah, I don't. I don't think I'm nearly as good as these people fucking think. <laughs> like I am not that good. And you know, I mean, that's that's that is one of those things. Like you're just another guy, right? Yeah. We're just throwing drugs. That's it. You know, anybody can throw a drug. You can train a monkey to throw a drug. Yep. And a parachute. Yeah, well, that's what so, I used to say about uh, flying in the cockpit. Uh, uh, I'm just the monkey pushing buttons. Yeah, that's it. I'm literally everything I'm doing. I've been programmed to do knee jerk reaction like you have to, you know, throw your pilot shoot and cut away. <laughs> it's just a, a slightly bigger list of shit to do. Right. <laughs> so um, what was your fir- your first time away was to Ohio. But I mean, you've traveled you're traveling all around the world now and have been for some time. So what was your first time internationally? No, actually, it was Mount Everest. Which mm. was, so Tom did, and was like, hey, I want you to come with me to Everest. And I was like, okay, let's try it out, you know. And uh, went to Everest, had a blast with Tom and the crew, PH, Wendy and Omar. Uh, and it just kind of amped me on doing stuff. And mm. then next thing I know, I'm traveling all over the world, you know. It made it so much more easy for me <laughs> well it's it's uh i don't think there has ever been a month in the sport that's gone by that i didn't look around and go i can't fucking believe they're letting me do this shit they're they're paying me to do this shit yeah yeah i'm i'm getting to travel all over the world which i talk to most people they haven't even seen they've seen one country or europe or bounced around and i'm going to africa asia every year yeah. maybe twice and gone to Europe at least once a year. And yeah. you know, that makes a whole different and people are paying for it. That's even better. You know? Oh and, yeah, man. I mean, the first time I got to go abroad, uh, I'm, I mean, not including Canada and Mexico, you know, being from California, uh, I went to Fiji to jump and I, I'm, I'm literally, I'm hopping on a 747 and flying halfway around the world to jump over some of the most gorgeous scenery on the planet getting attached to girls in bikinis and <laughs> i'm like how the how the fuck you know and it's not even a vacation because i was there for i want to say four and a half almost five months so right. i didn't go there to work a little bit i moved there for half a year right yeah and that was that i actually moved at one point to honduras Rota. and it was just a weird experience had a lot of fun but wow how beautiful a place and how much fun i had there and it just kept on, kept me going, right? Sure. And it just, it's ended up to where I am now. I mean, I'm just traveling probably five months of the year out of country, you know, wow. and that's super awesome to me because I love doing it. You know what I mean? And people really, uh, I don't know, there, there's there's obviously varying opinions about uh, tandems and, and tandem has kind of been a four letter word to a lot of the jumpers in, in the sport because they, they, I don't know, for some reason it just is... I don't want to say it's not well respected because I don't think people don't respect it. They just a lot of people don't want to do it. And I don't know about you, but looking back out of all my jumps, the ones that are the most memorable and my favorite are pretty much all tandems. Oh, for sure. For me, too. Uh, I mean, I have my own fun jumps that I remember a lot. They're always super fun. But tandems for me is one of those things, feeling the person, jumping over magical places and even open it a little higher because we're tandems yeah so much more of a view and we've noticed more stuff and it's just one of those things but also you know people will even talk negatively a little bit about tandem instructors but we're actually bringing the skydivers into the industry you know what i mean a good instructor brings more people in versus yep. the bad instructors. and we've all seen it. you know the guys will sit there and not talk to them you know, give me the money and on to the next, you know, and it's, it's really not about that. It's about talking to your people, making them want to join, be a part of USBA or join and be a part of skydiving. Yep. And, uh, and doing this, you know, and doing a little bit more for them. So I think it makes a big change for them. Oh, and for I, sure. Well, they'll come up to me years later. I don't really remember, but they're like, hey, you took me on my first skydive and you're the reason I'm in this sport. I'm all like, I am super sorry, but yes, yeah. thank you. <laughs> oh, I've had people come up to me the next day. Dude, you, that was so great what you did. And I'm a uh, what I do? Dude, you took yeah. me on a jump yesterday. Look, I'm sorry. Okay, here, give me a hug. All right. 
because <laughs> there's so many of them but you're right it's crazy rewarding when you find out this this incredibly positive impact that you've had on the people that you jumped with and you had fun when i was right. uh when i was flying at csc and i was hitting burnout i want to say it was 2010 and i'd just been flying so fucking much and i went to doug and i'm like i need like one or two days a week doing something different can I start chucking drugs again? And I started doing tandems a couple of days a week just to change things up. And I had so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you throwing those things. So, I mean, that was like one of those things I remember. When we were all, you're getting all close to that point in time. A little bit of burnout. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it was uh, we'd we'd all been going pretty hard, and and it was so feast or famine in Chicago. You know, I mean, we'd literally be starving to death, and then all of a sudden, you go from zero to a hundred in a heartbeat. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that was that was one thing from Chicago. We're broke in the fall. We're broke in the spring, but kings in the summer. <laughs> yeah. One of my uh, you may have even been on it. One of the coolest loads I ever flew was out of the Pac 750 in Chicago, and it was mild winds on the ground, but it was like 75 knots at altitude, and it's the only time I've ever flown backwards. Uh, and the guys were like, "How long should we wait?" And I'm like, "Until you see the canopies." <laughs> So a tandem would leave and they'd close the door, open the door and get out. Yeah, man, it was amazing. We were like three miles out. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. People are like, we're not going to make it back. I think uh, you may have been around, too, when I dropped that cross country. They got out, I want to say, 10 miles away and everybody made it back. Yeah, for sure. I remember that. It was uh, super fun. They were the days I always remember. You know, yeah. stuff's changed since then and now, you know, but, you know, people are like, oh, it's 20 knots upstairs. And I'm all like, come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I know it. Well, it was kind of funny because of having experiences like that. Flying in Dubai is the only place that they've ever actually gone on a weather hold for upper winds. And I'm like, mm-hmm. we're on a what? We're what? on a we're on a weather hold for upper winds. And all I'm thinking back to that time when I'm flying the pack backwards going, how can we possibly be on a weather hold for upper winds? <laughs> then again, in Dubai, it made more sense when you've got, you know, uh, skyscrapers that are 1500 feet high, basically on your base to final. Right. Exactly. It is much different. At that a little there. bit different. Ocean. Yeah. Speaking of the last time I saw you and I, I um, alluded to this at the beginning of the podcast, you were beat the fuck up because you'd been just killing yourself. And this was jumping at Everest. Yep. yep Holy yep. shit, man. You talk about putting in a uh, full effort. Oh, yeah. Everest is one of those places. And it's, you can't even really describe Everest because it's so magical and it's so wonderful. And the people are st- it's just, it it has its own majesticness to it with yes. the people and being simple and loving. And it's not about the money. It's just about love and showing. But it is something very, very tough on the body. Um, it's your own struggle to climb that thing. It's your own, it's, everything's on you. Yeah, you know, and each person has their own. I've seen big guys bigger than me and you go up there and do it, and I've seen smaller guys go and halfway do it, and just like this is not for me. Yeah, but we all—it's all equal when we get up there. We're all sure. Equal. It's all our own struggle. So, but I have to say, it's one of the most unique places I've ever been to. Everybody oh. goes there is touched by it, and it's in their heart forever. You know. Oh, yeah, without no. a doubt. Well, but no. for, for you especially, and, and this was, I, I got to see a, a bit of it that you didn't see because you were busy working. Um, people were really kind of blown away by your work ethic because you had, apparently you did this two times going up there, injured yourself on the way up to base camp before you were going to jump yeah. and jumped anyway. Yeah. So the first time I actually went up there, I actually broke my ankle. Yes. <laughs> Straight up, I was in Nancy Bazaar walking down to the coffee shop. They removed a stone out in the middle of the night and they were going to replace it. And I stuck my foot and twisted sideways. Pop. Oh. It was done. I mean, it swelled up like a balloon. I went into shock. 
Uh, it tiger striped. It was just bad. I mean, like the size of this, you know. And Ryan was like, "You're done," you know, like you're done. And uh, Tom Noonan comes in and goes, "Oh my God, what just happened?" You know, and I'm like, "I'm fine, I'm fine." And he's like, "You're not fine," and I'm all like, "I'll be fine." And he's like, "Well, don't worry, I'll take your wife on a tandem." But I'm all like, "Oh no, you're not." And he's like, "Man, we're not even up there yet." And I was like, "Yeah, that's just not gonna happen, Tom." And he's and he's like, "All right, you stay here for a couple of days. We're gonna go out and go look at it." And I was like, "All right, whatever." He's like, if you can hike the butter two hours to the top, I'll let you go. And so I very much crawl up to the top. I mean, on hands and knees, crawling, braced, wrapped, and they even carved me a cane, right? And you know the pass, it's rocky, it's not yep. flat. And I'm crawling up there. It takes me like three hours to get up. It's a super long time, you know, and they had a circle with me the whole time. Had a great time, and Tom's like, I can't believe you're even up here. And I was like, Tom, I don't need a leg to jump out of a helicopter, and I definitely don't need a leg to land a tan. <laughs> and he's all like, all right, well, <laughs> that good. And I literally started jumping on one foot all the way to the helicopter, like, doop, 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 doop. And he was all like, this is crazy. And it was a solo at first. And I can remember Roddy, the vigil sitting right behind me, and, you know, it's live. Everybody knows a lot, and it, you know, and I'm nervous because, of course, I don't have a candy break on the back of me, which I always feel so much more comfortable with a candy break now. Sure. And Lottie's looking at me, and we're both looking down like, uh, do you see the drop, though? And he's like, I don't see it. I don't see anything. And, it, it, you know, I think you go from, you know, being normal skydiver, you see everything, you know, you notice everything. You notice next jumper, you notice this, that on the ground, you know, as many jumps as we have, it opens up. But then when you're up there on Everest, it goes down to a storm. <laughs> and I, I'm like, and I'm telling him, I'll be there. And he's like, it's right below you. And I, I look at Lottie and he's like, I don't know, I don't know. And I'm like, all right, well, forget it, let's do it. And out we went. <laughs> Most memorable jumps I've ever had been like, I don't see this place at all. And we're over the Himalayas. And, you know, Tom's like giving you this speech, like, you have to make it here because if you don't, you're not going to make it through this. And, you know, and he's just giving you this horrible, like, have to make landing area. But once you see it, you know, it's a pretty big landing area. Sure. But, and I can just remember in free fall, I still don't see it. I still don't see it. I still don't see it. Open my parachute. And I'm like, oh my God, there's my parachute. Good. I'm alive. Do a full circle. And all of a sudden, the flags just popped out. You're like, oh, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank fuck. <laughs> Which, and, and uh, I mean, any experienced jumpers, um, not that it's a good thing, but uh, uh, I've exited an aircraft a few times without being quite as sure as I should have been where I was going, but it wasn't surrounded by the fucking Himalayas. Yeah, it's one of those things. Like, like I said, it's a zoom of focus. It's like, oh my God, what is yeah, going man. on? So, so this last year, what happened? So this year, again, my ankle... Still is not as stable as I want it to be after that incident. Um, I'm working on it. But what happened to us, I was up there, top, getting ready for tandems, and just walked down a step and rolled it right over. Bam. Rips and tendons. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm the only tandem master. There's nothing else. I mean, you're there, but there's nobody else that's done the job. So it's yeah. like, we got two tandems. You know, and I'm like, well, still don't need a leg to jump out of the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get her done and you know ph like oh are you sure and i'm like we're here yep. they pay the money. we have to do the jump you know yep. like again in free fall don't need a leg to jump <laughs> yeah well it was it was so funny because uh, um because you were having a tough time um I mean, everybody noticed. They're like, holy shit, I can't believe Matt's fucking jumping. And so um, because I was there and and I get super eager when stuff like that's going on, I get super amped just to be around it because it was so cool. In fact, when I was there uh, two years before, I think I must have annoyed the fuck out of everybody because I was just like, oh, my God, this is amazing talking to everybody. And so I tried to back it down a little bit. But as soon as I saw you were hurting, I'm like, all right, fuck, I'll help out. I'll grab the rig. I'll do this. I'll do that. And then next thing you know, 
I'm packing parachutes for the next load going, I haven't packed a parachute in like a couple of years. And I was, I was packing for pH and I'm handing him the rig going, Oh man. And so I'm standing there on the landing area and you guys are getting out. And then I watch him open and I'm like, yes, yes. Thank fuck. <laughs> I didn't fuck up this pack job. And, uh, um, he actually, uh, uh, he offered me a slot to jump and, I was heartbroken because I was only six months out of my last surgery from my neck and I had to fucking turn it down, man. Oh, I know. And that's, that, that, that I still stings. You, oh, you know, it's your, it was your time and you're up there. And I remember the first time you went up, such a struggle. And yeah. it is. Everest will beat out everybody. You know, it's their own thing. And I remember that. It was really yeah. rough. First yeah, yeah. Time Wonderful! I came down and met us, and it was like, "Oh man, congratulations! You made base camp, and I, I think you went to Tokyo Pass." And yeah, I did whole, everything, man. Um, Gore, I, did you make it up Gorshep and everything? Like that? Uh, yeah, I went up Gorshep. That's where I scattered the ashes of of a few of the fellows, and then I did base camp the next day. Then I went uh, over Chola Pass, Gokyo, Gokyo Ri. I did the whole nine yards before I made it back to you guys, and I actually made it to. Um, almost all the way back to uh namchi from gokyo lake in a day only oh. because omar was like hey uh are you coming down for i'm like yeah i'm at gokyo lake he's all cool well, we're gonna be at the at the drop zone tomorrow so i should see you tomorrow and i yeah. didn't really realize how far gokyo <laughs> lake and and fucking namchi were and so i'm just marching along going gotta meet omar gotta can't let omar down he's expecting me today and then nine hours into it i'm like the fuck is Omar's out of his goddamn mind? <laughs> That's a different breed of human. <laughs> he is. He is. He is. Well, and for anybody that knows him, ask him about his uh, his story of of trekking in the Himalayas and hanging out with Russell Bryce and Russell Bryce saving his life. And that's all I'm going to say. Just ask ask Omar about that. It's a hell of a story. Oh, I have to ask him about that. It's an amazing story. So, a pre podcast we were talking about. You are um, now doing some stuff for an, yet another uh, jump in another country. What is it you're working on? Uh, so we're working on quite a bit of things, but uh, right now we're working with the Egyptians to help them out to actually set up their federation. They have a federation, but they've also joined USPA. So we're helping them appoint new SPAs. To different positions we're hoping to get an SCTA for each event and then one for the drop zone itself you know and kind of really walking them down what an SCTA role is not what what we don't want them to do with the STA. sure so, yeah. is it uh, do you find working in regard to this type of stuff especially with the USPA and so many international federations is it is it difficult to try and get the USPA message across? Because I mean, everybody's kind of got a slightly different way of doing things. Right. So a lot of people think that we are trying to control the world. We don't. That's not our our job as USPA. We like to give information, but most people are always think, "Oh, you have all these rules," and I'm like, "What rule do you think we have? Well, you can't go through trouble. Well, that's not set up by USPA. That's a farm. That's set up by the FAA. Well, you have to have a seatbelt. That's set up by FAA." And you start going through these lines and they're like, oh, well, I just didn't know. And I'm all like, I, out of country, we don't care what a skydiver does. We only particularly care about what suckers and how safe they are. And that's sure. really And we want everybody to learn, but we also want the information from them so we can learn something. And I think a lot of people think USPA are cops. No, we're just looking for research data. And in the United States, we we really do control or not control. I hate to use that word. We do the most jumps worldwide. Sure. Um, we have the most skydivers. So we get a lot of information and we try to pass them on. If you use it, perfect. If you don't, we understand. You know, and you start talking to French, you talk to the UKs, and they're like, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, your country is the size of Maine. <laughs> <laughs> We have United States, like take all of Europe or, you know what I mean? I was like, it's much different, you know what I mean? But I think that once people start talking to us or even talking to me about USPA, they actually like the idea, you know what sure. I mean? Like, We're not here to control you. We're here to give you suggestions. Sure. And people forget about that. The BSRs are only two pages. 
That's the only rules we have are two pages. And if you're foreign, it only comes down to one page. <laughs> sure, sure. And and it it's just so funny. They just don't realize that. I said, this whole book or these whole books that we have, the IRA, the SAM, or even the government, they know, they're just suggestions. And everything's waiver. I mean, that's one of those things. I mean, we probably won't waiver you to smoke pot before you get out of the plane or shoot, <laughs> shoot up. I mean, that's just one of those things. They're not going to get waiver for you right. know. I mean? But we will waiver anything. And then I think that people just don't understand that. What we're just trying to do is make sure that skydivers have a license uh, and rate so they can go somewhere to have a rating for a car. So when they show up to the next drop zone, they have something listed for the drop zone and go, okay, he was rated in the AFF, IED, static line tandem. And what system is it? Sure. That's it. That's all we well, do. Give a chance. And I mean, the USPA is pretty much accepted worldwide, no? Yeah, yeah, we're the largest federation next to, I would say, Australia right now. And then, sure. and they're the big boys. And we work with each other. So they're, they're very compatible and they, they have different things. You know, Australia is allowed to do night tandems and different things with short rate demos, stuff like that. We're not allowed to because of the FAA. Sure. So that has to be with them. But I mean, these are things that, as USPA, we just want to get information out to people, help them out, you know, just give them something. To end. We are starting now with a lot of more billions, you know, we're starting to make drop zones all over, or memberships all over. Uh, Mongolia is now the big one we're working with. We're starting to work in China. And just to give them something to have sure. while they have their own feathers. Because the idea is to have everybody have a feathers and, and be able to work between. Sure. You know, as you get a rating, Sometimes the problem is that you're not able to jump in certain places because that rating doesn't match their ratings. Even though USPA seems to be the big dog in the sure. industry, which we're, we try not to be. We just want to be all over. I mean, we want people to be able to jump either way. So I think we're, what I want to work on in this future is to be able to have the French or the Australians be able to use our, let their ratings match into our ratings. So we can use it. I mean, I would love to jump Australia, but I have to go over there and do it all over again. I remember yeah. Tom Noonan going over there, teaching the examiners, right? And having this meeting with all the examiners in Australia for UPT. And he's like, hey, I want to do a tandem. They're like, hey, you need to take a tandem course. <laughs> he's like, I just taught you to be an examiner. He's like, yeah, well, that's how it works. <laughs> and he was all like, okay, well, then teach me. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, some of the bureaucracy, I can understand why your average jumper gets uh, either overloaded or annoyed with it, um, or they don't understand why, but uh, it doesn't take a lot of digging to figure out that, again, like you've said, the majority of the regulations aren't put down by, well, not even regulations, rules are not put down by the USPA. Um, and like you brought up uh, night tandems, it's a shame you can't do them. So they're oh. fucking amazing. I did the I, knock wood. I actually, my claim to fame is I got to do the very first ever night tandem done in New Zealand. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. Terrifying place to fucking do it. Oh, my, uh, my, mine was uh, over Cairo. That over Cairo? First night jump ever out. First person out in the tandem. So, <laughs> but. It was super amazing. I mean, it's so funny that Cairo light lit the canopy up, you know. And I remember all these jumpers jumping out behind me, going, "Oh my god, I got like eighty jumpers right behind me." Yep. And none of them brought glow sticks or flashlights. And I'm all, <laughs> "Oh my god!" And I passed uh, my wife the flashlight. She just like waving all over my canopy. And <laughs> <laughs> We're here. But, Leave us alone. Yep. Yeah, having uh, been yeah. to uh, having been to Egypt and gone out to the uh, um, the pyramids, it's funny because you see the pictures of the pyramids and all the photos I've ever seen make it look like it's way out in the desert and it's it's in this barren landscape, and you don't realize that if you face the other direction, there's fucking Cairo is right there. Yeah, yeah. it this is, is like one of the largest cities in the world, and you're like, oh my god, it's the sea. Yeah, yep. <laughs> yep. No. and the most terrifying drive anywhere ever. Ever. Yeah, yeah. I always thought Nepal was awful, especially like Kathmandu with the 
the same traffic and then you go to Cairo. And you're like, Shit. Catman, do they at least stay on the the correct side of the road? But uh, right. with with Cairo, I think they stop painting the lines in the road because nobody fucking. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's the four lane, but how did we get ten lanes yet? <laughs> yeah, 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 no, it's it's absolutely amazing. Myself and and one of the other pilots from Dubai, when we did that cross country flight over to uh, to Switzerland. Uh, with one of the aircrafts, we ended up when we came back due to wind and weather, we ended up landing in Cairo and and got to go see the uh, the pyramids and stuff. And holy shit, the drive from the hotel to the pyramids was just insanity. Jaw on the floor. Oh my god, how does this work? Right, right. Oh, imagine. I mean, I not uh, at certain events. I know they have laid it in the city, and yeah. you're like, I couldn't imagine landing in that city anywhere. You know, no. and they're like, well, yeah, we have a tandem lane in there. And I'm all like, oh, where? my God. Where? Yeah. Where? 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 On top of a building? <laughs> yeah, there's not one fucking square foot that's not accounted for. Right, yeah. But what an amazing place. I mean, I can remember doing our down basin final right around the large pyramid, like just circling. And I can remember on the north pyramid, almost toe tackle off the top of it, just doing it right down. Isn't that like, crazy? That it, it was insane, and that I can't. I, it's just one of those magical places. I tell people that's probably your first international event you want to go to. Large landing area, great plane, great overnight. It's like, well, which one's better? And I'm like, there is no better. They all do the same. They all jump the same. Just pick the one you want to go to. Yeah. I mean, they're all. The same. You know? Yeah, I mean, some of the video that I've seen, especially the wingsuit stuff of them, you know, buzzing the top of the pyramid and flying down below the pyramid, and then flaring up and landing next to it. It's just amazing. Yeah, yeah. I was actually there for that one. <laughs> Were you? Oh, man. I mean, I uh, um, when we got to fly over the pyramids, uh, just crossing over in the otter, ferrying it over, me and, and Ty are losing our shit, you know, leaning out the windows and taking pictures and stuff. Oh, my God, it's the pyramid. So I can't even imagine jumping there. Yes, it's a, it's one of those. Bad, I always say it's one of the bucket lists, you know, yeah, like yeah. The bucket list, you know, the holy grails of skydiving, you know. Yeah. It's what everybody knows. Egypt's one of those holy grails, and it's it's magical. It's a magical place. Um, you have to be ready for Egypt, of course. <laughs> for sure. Well, I love that uh, um, that it's becoming so international and that there are now so many more destination events than there ever were. And it's guys like you and that are, are helping set stuff up and Omar, who's, yeah. uh, you know, spearheading so many of these different things. And uh, I mean, they've got the Maldives going and they've got uh, Bali going, the pyramids yeah. going, Everest, uh, all these incredible destination spots to go jump that are just absolutely i mean beyond okay. imagination yeah yeah well that's the one thing i mean it, i think it kind of started with like uh herman lansman and he kind of started doing a little bit and uh, i want to say in asia and australia and then rich Grimm came in probably about 30 years ago and started doing this really big going all the way doing this events. and i that was one of that i went to in maldives and then i saw his event and it was like wow this is great you know and he puts on probably, I would say, Rich Grimm is probably the best organizer for foreign events, just traveling. Sure. I'm like, I trust Grimm, Rich, 100%. And what he says, yeah, you're going, okay, gotcha, do it. And sure. uh, then I actually started throwing my own. I do Iceland now, and I throw that one, working on Greenland. But yeah, we're starting to see all these new countries, Kenya, and Saudi Arabia, Maldives, Seychelles. Yeah. Beautiful places that are just so gorgeous that you always see in the pictures that you're like, I really want to go there. But now we have skydiving with it. So, and you got your buddies coming. So it gives you a really good reason to go. And they're really actually in affordable places. You know what sure. I mean? That makes it even better because you're with your buddies, skydiving, doing what you love, seeing something new and just enjoying. So that's always one of the. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it, it really is. I mean, and, and, and seeing more and more and, and like it used to be the destination spot for fuck the first dozen years I was jumping would be the pictures of the big blue hole. People yeah. are jumping over the big blue hole. And that was the most exotic thing you've ever seen. And now uh, who I think it was Omar posted a picture landing next to fucking elephants and shit. And you're like, yeah. what? what is this? Like we could do this, you know, and yeah. that makes it even 
more magical. You know, I know a lot of people go on all these uh, events, you know, um, it just, and also the one thing also is with the U.S. or even the foreigners, we don't really get to meet them. You know what I mean? We don't get to meet the Russians or the Chinese or, you know, the Egyptians. But when you go to these events, you're meeting all international people. Yep. Realizing that we're really the same people. We're just having fun. I even had at Egypt last year, which was weird to me, I had Russians and Ukrainians jumping together. And I'm all like, what is this? (laughs) Yeah. Well, that was one of the great things about being in Dubai as long as I was. It was such an international group of people. I mean, I was in the minority as an American. There were very few Americans. Uh, but there are Russian instructors there, Ukrainian jumpers that are both throwing their hands up going, I don't know. <laughs> I just want to jump out of a fucking plane and and Belarusians and all these different people from all around the world that are jumping there and having an absolutely fucking wonderful time. And it's there and, and everywhere else. It's that's the best part about skydiving is it, it there's common ground regardless of who you are or where you're from. Oh, for sure. And yeah, that's one thing that you actually start. You start realizing when you start talking to all these different groups, then we're all the same. There's no politics. We just want to jump out of plane, have fun, see each other under canopy, swoop together, and have just a blast. And yeah. afterwards, have beers together. You know what I mean? We just all that stuff goes away. You know it what does. I mean? It does. That's, that's one of the awesome things. And as you meet people, they invite you to the next event. You go to the next event. You get the next one. The next thing you know, you're in somewhere else, like Tanzania. Like, how did I end up here? Sure. Here. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and you and I know better than than a lot of people that uh, uh, the one thing that follows you very quickly and forever is your reputation in skydiving. And the best thing about skydivers it, far and wide is everybody fucks up. Everybody has good days and bad days. But on the whole, people accept you for who you are. Take you for what I mean, I was the asshole pilot that everybody knew was going to fly fast. And I was happy on the ground. But don't fuck with me in the plane. He's a dick. And everybody knew it and it was great because they knew not to take it personally. And, and, uh, uh, so they knew me for what I was and accepted me for who I was. And, and, uh, but boy, I'll tell you what, um, you either get a reputation as the guy that you want to have a beer with, or you get the reputation as the guy that nobody wants to be around and you don't want to be that latter guy. And I, I've been that guy. Everybody's been that guy at one point or another. And it's so nice to know that the community let you move on, but we've, <laughs> it's, oh. I had my, my burnout times, I would say definitely. Everybody did. Yeah, 2012 for me was just, it was a rough time for me, I think. Uh, just going through a lot of divorce and... Uh, yeah, man. And I mean, it was just, you know, you have your ups and downs. Kind of and there's always redemption. In this kind of yes, thing. that's the best part about it, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's... it's uh, um, we uh, Skydivers don't seem to hold grudges. For Which sure. is my favorite thing, because if, yeah. if Scott Evers held grudges, fucking half the sport wouldn't talk to me by now. <laughs> oh, <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> So speaking of, um, as people are listening, they're hearing you talk about all these wonderful international places. How do people follow you to find out where you're going next, how they come play, what the awesome events are? How do they track down Matt Yacht? Oh, so, yeah, uh, I'm on Facebook and Instagram as Matt Yacht, Y-O-U-N-T. Simple, easy. I always post events out to everybody. You're always happy more to call me to ask me what you, what my suggestion is at your level or what you're free flying, tracking, wingsuit. Uh, I try to hit as many as I can. There's a lot going on right now, uh, but each event has their specialty to it. You know what I mean? And I try to do as much as I can for everybody. I highly suggest you start looking around because it makes it such an opportunity to actually see things around the world and uh, i try to do a speech at pia every time they will do one about how to travel with rigs to what events are out there uh right now i'm getting ready to head out to seychelles in like two weeks to go jump out there with tandem so then and egypt and then i think i'm gonna take off the year with everest and i think i'm let one of our buddies jump this year up there who's going uh, Liberto. Oh, nice. So, yeah. So he's up on the total pole. He's been going to Nepal and working with Polkara, and he just went out to Denmark to do his high altitude stuff out there. And we only have like one or two tandems up there. So it's his, his time. You know what I mean? That's epic. What's, you got to share. You know what I mean? This, I mean, it's a team. We yeah. all got to be a team. 
And we want more people to come. We want more instructors. We want people, but we want them to give them a chance to earn their way to the evidence. You sure. know what I mean? So we do. And and there's other things going on. I might be going to Antarctica this year. So I'm all like, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, let's just have fun. You know what I mean? But yeah, that's, that's me. And I'm, I'm more happy. I pretty much know most of the organizers worldwide are doing these foreign traveling events. There's good ones and there's really good ones. I'll just say that. <laughs> <laughs> that was very diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, at my level, all events are good. Yeah. You know, at 100 jumps or 200 jumps, not all events are good for you, right? Sure. Sure. And that's some of the majestic of those events because they're never going to show you the ground shots. And not they give you, they're just going to say, hey, we're going to go jump this place over here. And when you open up, we'll have an X on the ground. And that's yeah. where you're playing. And that's, that's really cool because at my level, that's perfect. You know what sure. I mean? But 100 jumps, that is terrifying. <laughs> oh god yes man i mean i remember one of the things that will always stand out in my mind is thinking after i landed from my first tandem uh in fiji thank fuck i know what i'm doing uh and every jump that i made in fiji was uh oh fucking thread the needle on this one crosswind the wrong way up the beach with trees and people and fucking islands everywhere and you know oh my god God, there was never one landing that I wasn't like, oh fuck, I'm I'm glad I'm on my game. Yeah, I mean, you know, you get jumps that are like, there's no outs, you know, you make you break. You know, like, yep. And you're taking a walk in with us, and I was like, mm, like I'm okay, but you're putting a hundred jump wonder in there that can't even land on a mile sized field. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's where it's good to have a resource like you that can kind of aim people towards their skill level for the exotic stuff as well, and they can work their way up. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, I have the perfect places for you. Though. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There are great places all over for your levels. It can be 100 jobs to 10,000, and there's great places for everybody. And we'll enjoy, it doesn't matter if you go to these, Egypt, you're still going to enjoy it. It's fun. And, you know, or if you do Bali, that's a huge beach. Yeah, you know, miles, miles long, you know, football size field width wise, it's hard to miss. You know, yeah, it's, <laughs> like these are perfect places for you to jump. You know, I mean, and there's really tough ones out there. Sure. And at our level, that makes a lot of because that's yeah. a, like you ever sat somewhere and you're like, you know, the kind of parachute I can land this. Them are the jumps we're doing, right? You're like, oh, you know, <laughs> you also. 19 of your buddies following you in, you're like, oh, you know what I mean? But that's that's one of those things that I love about the international boogie is that we actually get to jump like national monuments that in the US you would never, the government would never let us. They could yeah, yeah. you know, but you're like, I could jump Mount Rushmore or Statue of Liberty or, you know, some of the amazing that we actually get to do over there, which is awesome. Like, you guys get to jump Palm. I oh, mean, yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely spectacular stuff. And and the, the best part about it is there's just going to be more and more and more because, uh, well, I mean, uh, thanks in a huge part to social media, you can see it. Like everybody sees all these incredible places and they get that spark and that idea and they're like, oh, fuck, I got to do this. And as long as we keep it safe, the sports can grow even more. Yeah, man. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we want these amazing places want the sport to grow so large that it's just a mecca. It doesn't matter where you go. You're just another guy and everything's being kind of around and we have so much more stories and so many more bodies and that it, it becomes just always a community and that a larger community would be even better, you know. For so sure. I, I, I just love this, you know. Uh, you know, like I said, I had my downs, but I'm on my ups right now. I'm oh, hell like, yeah, man. And and not too far in the future, we're going to be that generation that helped pave the way. <laughs> right, right, right. What the fuck is that? No, man, like, How the hell hey, that happened? Like your parachute in a tree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, dude, I cannot thank you enough. I can't wait to see what comes up next and, and to kind of follow it and figure out what next exotic location and and uh, uh, eventually send you a message going, dude, get me in. <laughs> <laughs> you and me and Bob come anytime. You know me. I'm all about it. You know. All right, like, brother. Get out. So definitely, you, come to Iceland. Hell yeah, man. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a good time. Good Love time. the idea. All right, brother, yeah. you take care. All right, have a good one. See ya. Well, there you have it. Another episode of the Lunatic Fringe Podcast brought to you as always by, well, wait, not as always, actually. Brought to you now by Gyro. Formerly known as NZ Aerosports, you'll head to gyro.com for their next level line of canopies. By Pussfoot, the Extreme Sports Collective. Head over to pussfoot.com to check it out. By Summit Parachute Systems, Check out SummitParachuteSystems.com to talk to Jarrett Martin and the gang about kick-ass pilot rigs, rigging courses, and more. By Flyaway Indoor Skydiving. Go to FlyawayTN.com and check out all the cutting-edge stuff to come. By Pure Spectrum CBD. Head to PureSpectrumCBD.com to check out their wide range of CBD products. And as for us, head to the LunaticFringePodcast.com to listen to any of the hundreds of episodes currently available. Hit the link for our YouTube channel, pick up your copy of the Lunatic Fringe book or The Accidental Stripper, and get a sneak peek at upcoming guests. Once again, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.